Okay, so I'm here to give you the overview of the, uh, the history of Magna Carta before the American colonies were settled, and then Professor Howard will, will move on uh, to, to uh, fill in the history after that. So I'll, I'll do the first 400 years here, um, or so, in 20 minutes. Um, so as a person who studies medieval legal history, there are really two dates uh, I can count on most people to know. One is 1066, the date of the Norman Conquest, and I, I hope all of you knew that one, but uh, the other is 1215, Magna Carta, right? And most people have heard some version of the story of how bad King John was brought to heel by his rebellious barons on the field at Runnymede, where they forced him to issue Magna Carta guaranteeing them certain liberties. So I'm going to be a bit of a killjoy today and argue that the year 1215 was less important in the history of Magna Carta than we generally assume which I understand is an odd thing to do for a 2015 anniversary. But it actually took a long time for the text that was agreed to in 1215 to transform into the great charter of liberties that we know as Magna Carta. A person looking at John's charter of liberties in 1215 probably wouldn't have thought it had a great future ahead of it. The charter is really a collection of miscellaneous grievances that various parties in England had against the king. It certainly contains some very general, uh, general provisions that speak in the language of high principle. Like chapter 40's, to no one will we sell, to no one deny, to no one delay, right or justice. But we need to contrast this with chapter 33's, all fishwares, those are traps for catching fish, are in the future to be removed from the Thames and the Medway. Or chapter 35's, there is to be one measure of wine throughout our kingdom. Or chapter 50s, we will remove entirely the kinsmen of Gerard Date from their bailiwicks. Or chapter 59s, we will deal with Alexander, King of Scots, concerning the return of his sisters and hostages. If you look at the original 1215 copies of the charter, of which there are four, the neat arrangement into chapters disappears. There's just one large block of text, and one sentence essentially runs into another. There isn't much rhyme or reason to their order, either. So there's a series of highly technical chapters about the operation of the king's courts uh, early on in the charter. It's broken in the middle by a chapter that says, neither township nor man is to be distrained to make bridges over rivers, except those who should have old and rightfully do so. And I've always imagined that when they were in the middle of discussing the operation of the king's courts, somebody just ran into the room and said, don't forget the bridges. And they had to write this in in the middle. Uh, but it's, it's just sort of a, a random addition to that, that series of, of chapters. The 1215 charter wasn't so much a constitution as a peace treaty, meant to avoid a civil war between John and his barons. Anger at John had been growing in England for a while in 1215. John had been raising money through some pretty arbitrary financial exactions on his barons. In 1212, for instance, a wealthy widow paid the king 3,300 pounds, which would be millions of dollars in today's money, for the privilege of not being married off to one of John's cronies for a third time. John would exact these payments from his barons, and often they just didn't have the ability to pay. 3,300 3, pounds was not an amount of cash really anybody had sitting around in the 13th century. But he'd leave the debt hanging over them as a form of political control. If you behaved yourself, part of the debt might be forgiven. Uh, but he also needed the cash, so he would keep collecting periodically. In a sense, he wasn't very different from his father, Henry II, who is the father of the common law, or his brother, Richard the Lionhearted. The barons tended to put up with their exactions, and there's a sense in which John was never going to compare favorably to a brother whose nickname was the Lionhearted. You have to sort of feel sorry for him in that, in that sense. And John did keep tighter reins on the royal government. That, that bothered some people in England. He was a little bit more oppressive in collecting the money than his father and, and his brother had been, although not a lot more oppressive than his father and his brother. I think John's main sin in the eyes of his barons was that he was a loser. In 1204, John lost Normandy to King Philip Augustus of France. Many of his wealthier barons held land on both sides of the channel, in England and Normandy. And they had to watch Philip Augustus parcel out their Norman estates to Philip's own barons. There was still hope of recovering Normandy for about the next 10 years. But in 1214, John was dealt a crushing defeat at the Battle of Bouvines, and that 
Uh, and at that point, lost all hope of recovering Normandy in his lifetime. No one thought they were getting Normandy back at that point. Bouvines was essentially the last straw for the barons. It also didn't help that between 1207 and 1214, John was engaged in a protracted fight with the Pope over the election of the Archbishop of Canterbury. John was excommunicated and an interdict was placed over England. And an interdict meant that most of the sacraments couldn't be performed in England. Uh, priests were forbidden to perform the sacraments. That didn't sit well with the church or with anyone who, say, wanted to get married between 1208 and 1214, right? Because you couldn't, you couldn't have a wedding ceremony between, between those years. Things finally came to a head in 1215, when the barons, the city of London, a good number of the bishops, and the Welsh princes all allied themselves against John. And in May, many of them renounced their fealty to him, which was a sign of rebellion. The events that took place at Runnymede in June, so just a month later, were really an attempt to avert a civil war. So Magna Carta was a peace treaty, but it was actually a failed peace treaty. Within three months of its issuance, John had repudiated it, and in fact had repudiated it with the blessing of the Pope. Pope Innocent III wrote to John and told him that the liberties the barons had asked for had derogated from the royal office, that certain powers were inherent in kingship, and that the barons couldn't take those away from him. By September, the Civil War, the charter that uh, had been meant to avert, had broken out. So June to September, that's, that's basically how long it lasts. That's not a very auspicious start for Magna Carta. The charter issued at Runnymede only became important because it was reissued in a heavily revised form several times. John died a little over a year after the Civil War broke out, leaving a nine-year-old son, Henry III. And John's side was losing the war when John died, and they were losing pretty badly. The barons had invited the King of France's son to take the, th the throne, and there was a large French army in England at the time. The gates of London were closed to the young king. They were actually for the rebels. Things were so bad that at Henry's coronation, the Royalist party didn't have control of Canterbury, where the king was traditionally crowned. And more importantly, they didn't have the crown. So an earl's wife actually donated her circlet uh, to stand in for the crown at that point. This is not the kind of coronation you hope for if you're, if you're making a political statement, right? That, you know, happy days are here again, right? Um, but Henry's guardians, he has two guardians who are appointed by John in his will. The papal legate, the pope's representative in England, a man named Guala, and William Marshall, the Earl of Pembroke, who was kind of the elder statesman in England at the time. He was part of the Royalist Party, but was respected by both sides. They were pretty savvy, and they worked hard to bring over people over to Henry's camp. As a show of good faith, they hastily issued a revised version of the charter in 1216. It was just one of many things they did to try to bring people over. Their strategies also included threats and pardons, you know, if we win this war, we're going to execute you for treason, or if you come over to our side, you'll receive a pardon. And much more tangible rewards like land, good marriages, and outright money bribes. They actually just bribe some people to come over to the royalist side. The version of the charter they issued in 1216 cut out several of the chapters that were in the 1215 Magna Carta, chapters that Henry guardians, Henry's guardians considered doubtful. They were mostly chapters that derogated from the royal office in some way. That's why they thought they were doubtful. But it included chapter 12's, no scootage or aid is to be imposed in our kingdom except by the common council of our kingdom. That chapter was read by 18th century Americans as establishing the principle of no taxation without representation. But it appears only in the 1215 version of the charter. It doesn't appear in any of the reissues. When the Civil War ended in 1217, Henry's guardians issued a second revision, together with another charter called the Charter of the Forest. And the Charter of the Forest was an important document in the 13th century. Forest had a technical legal meaning in this period. It didn't mean a place where there were trees. Uh, in fact, a lot of forest had no trees in it. It meant a place where the king had special hunting rights. About a third of the land in England was designated forest. People lived in the forest. There was farmland in the forest. And the forest was subject to a special body of law called the Forest Law, which was intended to protect the king's hunting rights. But it was also very harsh. 
For instance, if you lived in the royal forest and had a dog, and the justices of the forest found out about this dog, they would cut three toes off of each of its front paws so it couldn't chase deer. And then they would fine you one ox. That's a lot of money, basically. Think, think about that as you know, destroying your livelihood. If you kill the deer within the royal forest, they might gouge out your eyes and cut off your testicles. That was the traditional penalty. Uh, that was if they were in a good mood. If they were not in a good mood, they would just hang you for, for uh, killing a deer because the king had rights to that deer. So as you can imagine, forest law was widely resented. The forest charter tied the hands of the forest justices in some ways. It prevented them from maiming dogs except where the practice had been in place during the reign of Henry II. It set the fine for keeping, for keeping a dog in the forest at three shillings, not an ox. And it said the maximum penalty for killing a deer was a fine, no loss of testicles anymore. It was only with the 1217 issue that the Charter of Liberties, so the charter that was issued in 1215, revised in 1216 and 1217, became, became known as Magna Carta. And it was not because it was considered a great document. Rather, it was because it was bigger than the Forest Charter. So the personnel at the Exchequer, where the charters were kept, referred, them, referred to them from 1218 as Magna Carta and Parva Carta, the big charter and the little charter. One was longer than the other. Magna Carta didn't settle into its final form until Henry III issued a third revised version of the charter in 1225 in exchange for the barons' agreement to a tax. Henry needed money for his wars in Gascony, which was the last part of France still held by the English crown at this time. And incidentally, Gascony was England's main source of wine. Bordeaux is in Gascony, so you might say Gascony was strategically important to the English. The charter became a little more real to people in England after that 1225 reissue because they had paid for it. People in England were used to paying for liberties at this time. Counties would often pay the king for the right to elect their own sheriff, for instance, rather than have one selected by the king. And you could buy the kinds of liberties that were in Magna Carta. So purchasing a charter of liberties was something that, that made sense to people. And once they had paid for Magna Carta, they were more assertive about using Magna Carta against the king. The 1225, not the 1215, was actually the text that people thought of as Magna Carta for many centuries. In the collection of the Huntington Library, there's a statute book, a small book probably made for a lawyer as a reference. Lawyers would carry these around when they, the courts traveled in England. You, they had air circuits for a long time. And lawyers would make these books so they'd, they'd have references that they could take with them on the air circuit. The statute book dates from between 1286 and 1290, and it contains the texts of both the 1215 and the 1225 versions of the charter. But only the 1225 is referred to as Magna Carta. The 1215 is titled The Provisions of Runnymede. So they're thought of as different texts. The 1225 version, not the 1215, was the one that was confirmed and reissued throughout the 13th century. It's the version that was reissued by King Edward I, who you may know as the Hammer of the Scots and the villain in Braveheart. He reissued it in 1297. It's a 1297 text that sits in the National Archives, and that was a significant reissue in its own right. The 1225 version, not the 1215, was the one written under the statute roll. The English statutory tradition developed over the course of the 13th century. Various legal texts were issued by the king and by great councils, which by the end of the 13th century were being called parliaments. Uh, and the texts were variously called statutes, establishments, provisions, or constitutions. They didn't have a single term for these texts, and they didn't really think of them as a single group of texts either. Some of them were issued by the king, some were issued by the great council. Uh, some, some of these texts were just writs, but they were all considered authoritative in some sense. Lawyers would make arguments based on these texts in court, and courts would accept them as authoritative. By the 1280s, lawyers were making unofficial collections of these texts for their own reference, and they generally placed the 1225 Magna Carta first on the list. In 1299, some officials at the Exchequer made the first statute rule. This rule was only semi-official, made primarily for the use of exchequer officials who needed to know something about the law, but it was a model for the later official roles of parliament. And by the 1340s, 
Magna Carta had officially come to be regarded as England's oldest statute, parts of which are still binding law in both England and Virginia. Since the Code of Virginia adopts all of the statutes of England made before the settlement at Jamestown in 1607, unless they've been abrogated by something else, so don't worry too much about that, right? But uh, if they've been abrogated by the state or federal constitution or a subsequent statute, so Henry VIII's sumptuary laws are probably not the law in Virginia right now. Um, the 1215 text was largely forgotten until the 18th century. The earliest printed editions of the text were the 1225 version and associated Magna Carta with Henry III, not with John. When Sir Edward Cook wrote his line-by-line -line commentary on Magna Carta in the early 17th century, it was on the 1225 text. Sir William Blackstone finally made an edition that noted the distinction between the two texts in 1759. So the text that became politically significant in England in the centuries before the American Revolution was the 1225 text, not the 1215. And the significance of that text actually changed quite a bit over time. So if we take the 13th century, Magna Carta was certainly politically important. There were many calls for its confirmation or reissue over the course of the century. But when the Great Council, right, the predecessor to Parliament, called for the reissue of the charters, they often placed the reissue of the Forest Charter first on their list of demands, not the reissue of Magna Carta. The Forest Charter is a text that doesn't have a whole lot of political purchase today. It doesn't contain a lot of general statements of high-minded principle. It places restrictions on institutions that were specific to the 13th century. So it hasn't weathered the centuries nearly as well as Magna Carta has. It didn't, as far as I know, play any role in the debates at Philadelphia in 1787, for instance. Uh, although Professor Howard may correct me on that, we'll see. Um, but the Charter of Liberties does contain some very general language. Chapters 39 and 40 of the 1215 version, which were combined into chapter 29 of the 1225 version, are the chapters most read today and the ones that you're most likely to be familiar with. No free man is to be arrested or imprisoned or deceased or outlawed or exiled or in any other way ruined, nor will we go against him or send against him except by the lawful judgment of his peers or by the law of the land. And chapter 40, to no one shall we sell, to no one deny, to no one delay, right or justice. If you've read only one part of Magna Carta, that's probably it. These are wonderful statements of general principle. In fact, chapter 39 has actually been creatively misinterpreted over the years to be more general than it probably was intended to be. The phrase lex terrae, usually translated as the law of the land, may have referred, referred to some general principle that trials must be lawful. But there's a strong argument to be made that it actually meant something very specific, essentially trial by ordeal, uh, a type of trial that, that required an oath. Trial by ordeal was where it, they dunked you in a water pit to see if you floated or sank uh, or uh, made you carry a hot iron for a certain number of steps to see if your hand, the wound festered after you know, your hands were burned. Um, and if that's the case, basically what Magna Carta guarantees here is that you can't be imprisoned, arrested, or deprived unless you've at least gotten the chance to undergo an ordeal, right? Um, I'm sure we're all happy about that, right? Um, <coughs> That phrase, the phrase, the term lex, right, which is usually translated as law, actually often means oath in medieval Latin. Uh, and the phrase lex terrae specifically is used in some medieval texts to mean a, a trial that involves an oath or something like that, a type, of, a type of proof that involves an oath, and an ordeal would involve an oath. Trial by battle also involved an oath. So the legal treatise called Glanville, written about 25 years before Magna Carta, speaks of people making their lex terrae in a passage where it clearly means they're making an oath. But that phrase was transformed over time to mean something much more general. In 1356, amid concerns that the crown was arresting and imprisoning people without cause, Parliament passed a statute that glossed chapter 29. It swapped out the words, except by judgment of his peers or by the law of the land, with the words, except by due process of law, old French, due procès de lait, the first known use of that phrase. The chapter had come to stand for a very general principle, and a lot was read into that phrase, due procès de lait. Already in the 14th century, people were associating the words law of the land and due process of law 
with the right to a grand jury, for instance. Not with the right to a trial jury, oddly enough, but the right to a grand jury. They considered that, that an important protection. So Magna Carta was already being turned into a fundamental document in the 13th and 14th centuries and was treated as a special text from the late 13th century onwards. In the 14th and 15th centuries, it was often read at the opening of Parliament. But it didn't play much of a role in English law and politics between the 15th and 16th centuries. Shakespeare wrote a play called King John. I'll tell you right now, it's not one of his better plays. So I, I read it so you don't have to. Uh, he never mentions Magna Carta in that play. In fact, histories of John's reign before the 17th century were much more likely to emphasize his fight with the Pope than they were to mention Magna Carta. And this was often an attempt, especially after the Reformation, to turn John into sort of a proto-Protestant hero of, of sorts, that his fight with the Pope was actually about the freedom of the English church from, from papal control. Uh, early, in earlier centuries, before the Reformation, it was usually used to, as an example of his impiety that he, he fought with the Pope. So, so switches in 15 whatever, 15, 1530s. But Magna Carta was resurrected in England in the 17th century by opponents of the Stuart monarchy, when royal power became a more pressing political issue. Sir Edward Cook, the famous Chief Justice, used it in his battles against King James I, and argued that Magna Carta was simply one historical confirmation of the ancient rights of Englishmen, which, in Cook's mind, had existed all the way back in the time of the ancient Britons. It protected the rights of individual subjects and limited the power of the monarch, in Cook's view. Cook was one of the drafters of the Virginia Company's charter in 1606, which guaranteed to the colonists all the liberties, franchises, and immunities their relatives in England had. And imagine, when he's thinking about liberties, he's probably thinking about the charter of liberties. I should probably leave it there because I think this is where Professor Howard's story picks up. We have to remember that the transformation from the provisions of Runnymede to the Magna Carta we know today was a long process. And I look forward to seeing you all at the anniversary celebrations in 2016, 2017, and 2025. <laughs> Thank you. Tom, thank you so much for making the trip from Williamsburg. Thanks also to the Student Legal Forum and the Federalist Society for making this event possible. Um, Tom has told you about Bad King John of myth and legend. Um, I was first introduced not in face-to-face -to, -face to King John, you understand, but I first met King John thanks to A.A. Milne. Uh, you, you will know A.A. A. Milne as the inventor of Winnie the Pooh. I'm sure all of you must make that association. Um, Milne also wrote a wonderful little book called Now We Are Six. When you become parents and that sort of thing, be sure to read this to your children. Uh, one of the poems in Now We Are Six is King John's Christmas. And it starts out with lines, if I remember it correctly, something like, um, King John was not a good man. He had his many ways. And Sometimes no one spoke to him for days and days and days. Well, <laughs> I'm a kid, and I said, nobody could be that bad. Well, I grew up and did some reading, and I discovered he was at least that bad, <laughs> if not worse. Well, Tom has given you, has painted a very vivid picture of the medieval story. That's not easy to do. I compliment him on doing that. And I want to pick the story up there at the point at which Magna Carta crosses the Atlantic. Uh, because after all, one of the questions is, okay, 800 years, naturally the English will make a big deal of Magna Carta, but you know, why in the world should Americans care about this bargain struck between a reluctant king and his not very happen, happy barons? Well, the 17th century is the pivot, as Tom suggested, because that's the century during which on the English side you have turbulence and conflict between Parliament and the Crown, the Parliament and the Stuarts, in which... Sir Edward Cook was the chief, not only the great commentator on Magna Carta, but the, one of the chief political leaders in the uh, complaints against uh, James I and, and, and then Charles I. It produced the first of some 17th century English liberty documents, the great Petition of Right of 1628. And it was during that controversy that Cook basically resurrected Magna Carta. As Tom mentioned, uh, Shakespeare's King John doesn't mention Magna Carta, so you might have thought it had been forgotten, but uh, basically Cook and his colleagues brought it forward to say Magna Carta matters. 
and it's one way of asserting our rights against the overreach of royal prerogative. Well, if you trace English history down through the 17th century, it was a, a dreadful century in all respects. The English Civil War, the Cromwellian Commonwealth, the execution of Charles I, the restoration of the Stuarts is really quite a time of great upheaval. And it ends, for our purposes, with the English Bill of Rights of 1689, the great document that actually in many ways creates provisions which you'll find in the American Constitution and the American Bill of Rights. Well, all those English events are important for the American story because while English England was in this period of upheaval, the American colonies were being planted, starting with Jamestown in 1607. I want to drive that date home. I just gave a lecture last fall in, at Boston's Fannel Hall, and they have a curious way of beginning history in New England in 1620. And they don't quite get the point that 1607 is a lower number than 1620. But here in Virginia, we, can, we, we get the point. The Virginia Company Charter, which Tom referenced, contained a lot of language. It was a stock company. I mean, the people who invested in that charter thought they were going to get rich because Virginia was going to have a lot of gold and silver. But for our purposes, the provision that's the most important is the one that says that those who emigrated to Virginia would enjoy the privileges, franchises, and immunities uh, that they would have enjoyed in England. Now that's important. I don't think a colonist of Spain or Portugal could have pointed to similar language in their charters. It was distinctive to the English charter uh, colonies. And what it meant, I said, it was advertising. I suppose it was a way of getting people to leave England and come across the Atlantic to a very uncertain place, the, the, the new colonies. But what it was understood to mean was when you made that trip, you didn't leave your rights behind. You brought your rights with you, and surely they must have understood foremost among those rights was Magna Carta. Well, then Virginia, successive colonies down through the 17th century, each of the colonies' charters, whether they were proprietary or royal or, or stock companies, would have this, this essential language about privileges, franchises, and immunities. So that's where it really begins on the American side, reinforced then by the introduction in many forms of English law. You know, English-speaking colonists, subject to the crown, you would expect English law to take root, and of course it did. It's interesting if you look at the inventories of colonial libraries in the 17th century, you find a few uh, basic books that are replicated in almost all those libraries, and they tend to be Cook's reports and Cook's commentaries on Magna Carta. If time permitted, and it doesn't, I would tell you stories about ways in which colonists invoke Magna Carta against their own governors and their own magistrates, for example, in Massachusetts. Uh, William Penn, after a, being tried in a famous case in England, later became the proprietor of Pennsylvania. He was responsible for the first publication in America of Magna Carta. So that's basically the 17th century is where the seeds are being planted. By the 18th century, generations have passed you reach the point in the 1760s where after the what was Seven Years' War in, in Europe, the French and Indian War in this country, uh, Parliament was casting about for some way of paying off all those immense war debts. And they said, well, we defended the, the, the colonists' frontiers. We'll ask them to pay part of the bill. Well, all of you who studied American history know that story of how the Americans weren't going to have that. This is the no taxation without principle. We, we don't elect members of parliament. We're not going to pay these taxes. So you get the Boston Tea Party and the other events. Well, during that period, Americans were already, in effect, thinking like constitutional lawyers. They were looking for a way of putting into legal framework their complaints against the Crown and Parliament. And they found Magna Carta wonderfully useful to that purpose. So if you read the tracts and resolutions and pamphlets of the 1760s and 1770s, you find Mark Magna Carta front and center. But what you also find is interesting. It's not simply a linear story of using Magna Carta and, and English common law principles. Americans already were beginning to blend different ways of thinking about constitutionalism into, into a single package. So those uh, early resolutions, for example, the 1774 Continental Congress, you'll find the British Constitution, Magna Carta, you'll find the early charters, like the Charter of Virginia, and then you'll find a dose of uh, natural law, natural right, 
a word of God. If you were a New Englander, you probably tossed a little covenant theology in there. And you stirred it all up and mixed it around and you said, here it is. This is the American case. It's very eclectic. And it's, it shows to, to the French legal mind, this is all very untidy. The civil law doesn't like this sort of messiness, but all of you who've studied constitutional law in the first year at the law school will appreciate how untidy American constitutional law is. And one reason it is, is that's the way we started. We began in the founding generation of, th of being comfortable with the idea that you could have different threads of thought all supporting the same argument. Well, revolution was, of course, undertaken and, 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 and successfully executed. And the story then takes us to the early American state constitutions. The story starts in Williamsburg, uh, May of 1776. The, what had been the House of Burgesses of the colonial legislature, the royal governor told them to go home. They decided they would stay around. Uh, being good Virginians, they went across the street to Raleigh Tavern, and that's where <laughs> the first Virginia Constitution was written. So if it has a few boozy fingerprints on it, you'll understand why that happened. Um, it's interesting that when they sat down to think about independence, the Virginia Convention instructed their delegates in Philadelphia at the Continental Congress to introduce the resolution that became the famous Declaration of Independence. On the same day that they uh, effected that resolution, they set to work on two documents, a Declaration of Rights for Virginia and a frame of government. Uh, today's Virginia Constitution, the Bill of Rights is simply Article I of the Constitution, but in 1776, it was thought of as a two-step process. It's, if you've read John Locke and his theory of the social compact, you'll recognize the notion that the first thing you do is to declare your natural rights. And then once that business is settled, then you move on to the business of creating a government, a frame of government. So you have natural rights that pre-exist government in the Virginia Declaration of Rights. Then, of course, other states wrote constitutions. And I, as you know, it finally winds up after some years later, the Articles of Confederation, and ultimately the federal constitution at Philadelphia in 1787. Now, where does Magna Carta fit into that story? Uh, as far as I'm aware, uh, Magna Carta was never mentioned at the Federal Convention in Philadelphia. Now, we don't have a complete, we have Madison's notes on the convention, but we don't have a full transcript, so somebody may have mentioned it. But I think the reason Magna Carta might have been off stage is that if you think about the circumstances that brought Magna Carta into being, barons versus the king, a quarrel over power, who's going to have how much power to do what? How will you limit royal power on behalf of the barons and other people? Well, that's part of the Philadelphia story, but what was not happening at Runnymede that was happening at Philadelphia was the creation of a new government. That's not what the barons were about. That's not what the 17th century was about. The English Bill of Rights, again, was adjusting the boundaries of power. But Americans were creating a new government. Indeed, at that having hail the, the glories of Magna Carta during the 1760s and 70s, now they wanted to distinguish what they were doing for Magna Carta. They said, look, Magna Carta, they said, was a grant from the king, a concession from the king to, to the barons and to the church and to others. But what we're doing is establishing a new government based on popular sovereignty. We the people in the preamble to the U.S. Constitution. Well, as you know, at Philadelphia, when they wrote the Constitution, they did not add a Bill of Rights. And that was nearly fatal to the enterprise because the anti-Federalists jumped on that and said, ah, they've neglected to protect our rights. So in the ratifying conventions in the several states, uh, the vote was very close. Virginia and New York almost voted no. It was six votes in one state, 10 in the other. Um, and the concession was made by James Madison and the Federalists that, okay, look, just ratify the Constitution, and we will undertake at the first Congress to add a Bill of Rights. Well, they did that, as you know, and it was at that story that the um, Magna Carta, really, and the English tradition comes back into the picture. So, so what do you have in the founding period? You've got a blend of innovation on the one hand. Americans had done some pretty unlikely things. Federalism, 
was something new on the political theory stage. I mean, the, the idea was around for a long time, but the federal system itself was something novel. Uh, what became judicial review was pretty much an American invention. Uh, I would argue probably the most important American contribution to global constitutionalism. So you have innovation on the one hand, coupled with, on the other hand, tradition. And the tradition, of course, is the part that comes from Magna Carta. So that's the founding story. That's 200 odd years ago. How do we get from there to where we are now? I mean, does Magna Carta have any modern significance in American constitutional law? I think I could sum it up as being several propositions. First, the most, perhaps the most powerful association is with what we call the rule of law. Now that's a phrase that lawyers use very easily. We Americans just toss it off as if it's self-evident. I remember being at a meeting in um, what was then Leningrad, now St. Petersburg, working with Russian constitution makers after the collapse of the Soviet Union. <laughs> this was back in the days when it looked like Russia might be on the path of liberal democratic constitutionalism. Um, <laughs> It's a long time ago now. So we were working, <laughs> this is pre-Putin. Pre um, we were working, I don't speak any Russian, so we worked through translators. And uh, the translator was very good, a woman who was very fluent in both languages. But I discovered she was, when I was using the, the English language phrase rule of law, that she was translating it as socialist legality. <laughs> So I had to say, well, gosh, that's not exactly what we mean in America by the rule of law. So if you get some sense of rule of law, that's what Magna Carta is about. Secondly, Magna Carta contributes to the notion that when you make constitutions, you articulate fundamental right, rights that may be thought to have ancient origins and sometimes don't, but they're thought to, the notion that that's part of the stream of constitutionalism. Thirdly, I think the very idea of putting it in writing, having a written constitution. I mean, when we wrote our national constitution, we were the first country in the world to have one. The word constitution has been around since at least Greek times. Aristotle talked about constitutions. But summing it up in a written document, the English thought we were crazy to do that. Now, how can you put all this well, traditions and customs and conventions into a single document? But I think Curiously, Magna Carta contributes to that. Fourthly, I think Magna Carta, in a very important way, gives rise to the notion of constitutional supremacy. There was a statute long after Runnymede telling English judges that if they had two statutes in conflict, Magna Carta and some other statute, Magna Carta should be preferred, that the other statute should be considered null and void. It begins to sound a little like judicial review. I don't think it's to... I think it's really a canon of construction, but you can see the direction it's taking, that Magna Carta is coming to be seen as a super statute, something better than, than ordinary law. When uh, James Otis made the famous argument in Boston 1760 against the writs of assistance, the argument that in many ways predates our Fourth Amendment to the Constitution, uh, he made a constitutional argument. He cited Cook. He cited Cook's decision in Dr. Bonham's case, 1610, that's in which Cook said if an act of parliament were against right reason, it was null and void. Well, that doctrine died out in England. England, as you know, does not have what we call judicial review. But Otis and Americans took it to be part of their constitutional system, that indeed there were principles that would negate even acts of parliament. That ought to give you some idea why by the 1760s and 70s, England and America were so far apart in their understanding of what the constitutional issue was. By the 1760s, you had Blackstone's commentaries, and Blackstone was saying, you know, Parliament can do what it pleases. Parliament is, so that's where sovereignty resides, in the Crown and Parliament. That's not the American view. By that point, Americans were take, taking Cook as their Bible. They were saying, there are limits on what Parliament can do, and there are constitutional rights we have no taxation without consent, trial by jury being, being two of them. So the two uh, systems, two sister peoples are on very divergent paths by the time of the revolution. Uh, think about Marbury versus Madison. I'm sure you do. Probably every night before you go to bed, you th <laughs> think about John Marshall and Marbury versus Madison. Remember when you read the opinion, 
and as you know, it establishes the principle of judicial review. Marshall, in his analysis, explaining why the court has to have the power he asserts it does, begins with general principles of jurisprudence. He talks about the idea of a constitution, and then finally, almost as an afterthought, he says, oh yes, and by the way, there's Article VI of the Constitution, the Supremacy Clause. So understand Marshall and Marbury to be set in the state of mind of that generation of Americans, that they're just ways you think about constitutions. There are inherent limits on government, and how are you going to make those limits work? And he says, you do it by giving the courts the power of judicial review. Final Magna Carta contribution, the, the last theme I want to lay on the table, is one that could not be more contemporary. It's at work in the Supreme Court this term, and that is a tradition of organic, unfolding evolutionary constitutional development. Uh, this is the point, uh, dare I give it a label? Uh, may I breathe the words living constitution? I'm glad Justice Scalia is not in the room because he would snatch me from this lecture and beat me up outside in the <laughs> corridor. <laughs> but you know the argument, don't you? You have the textualist, the originalist on the one side. That's Justice Scalia and Thomas. You have the living constitution people. They may not call it that, but you know that's what the argument is. Uh, look at the story of due process of law. Tom has mentioned how law of the land evolved into the phrase what we call due process of law. And all of you can recite the incredible path of due process of law. I mean, look where it's taken us down through the years, through the Lochner era of economic substantive due process, the era since the Warren Court, Griswold and Roe, and cases beyond that of the unfolding and ever enlarging areas of personal autonomy, we will find out before the term is out whether same-sex marriage is one of those or not. Which leads me to quote Justice Kennedy, um, who will have a, we know, a very important vote to cast in the same-sex marriage case. This is Lawrence versus Texas, the 2003 case involving the Texas sodomy law. He says, those who drew the due process clause did not presume to know the components of liberty in its manifold possibilities. And he adds, the times can blind us to certain truths, and later generations can see that laws once thought necessary and proper serve only to oppress. As the Constitution endures, persons in every generation can invoke its principles in their own search for greater freedom. Could there be a clearer statement of the notion of a, what I would call a living Constitution? So there you have, in good part, the story of Magna Carta still being very much part of American constitutionalism. As an epilogue, let me mention that there actually are physical evidences of Magna Carta in our own country. Uh, the Lincoln Cathedral copy of the 1215 Charter was on loan at the Library of Congress. There are, depending on your account, at least 17 extant copies of Magna Carta from 1215 to 1297. Um, and they're all in England except one that's in Australia and one that's in America. I was on an airplane flying to London some years back and it happened to be sitting next to me a lawyer from Texas named Tom Davis. He was uh, Ross Perot's personal lawyer. And he told me the story of how Ross Perot heard there was a copy of Magna Carta, 1297 copy, in the hands of a private family in England and Ross Perot, who I assume had pretty much everything else, said, hey, I think I'd like to have a copy of Magna Carta. So he sends Tom Davis over to, to, to bargain with the family and execute a purchase of that particular copy for $1.5 million, which in the 1980s or thereabout was a fair amount of change. And so I said to Mr. Davis, okay, you bought this copy of Magna Carta, but it's in England. You want to take it to America. Don't they have laws about, you know, exporting the country's patrimony and all that? And he said, yes. He said, well, I said, what did you do? He said, well, I took this copy and I rolled it up and put it in a mailing tube. And I said, well, you put this priceless 13th century document in a mailing tube. And so he says, I went to Heathrow Airport. And the customs agent asked me what I had in the mailing tube. And I said, I've got a copy of Magna Carta. Chap says, oh, right, mate, go right on through. 
thinks he's got a facsimile. I go back, back. So he gets it on the airplane. I said, fine, you get it on the airplane. What then? He said, well, I put it in the overhead bin. I said, you, you can't be serious where people put their ski boots and their backpacks and all. You put it, well, it somehow survived the trip. That copy was on loan for years to the National Archives. And then, I guess, Ross Pro decided he didn't need Magna Carta anymore. He decided to sell it. Put it on auction in New York at Sotheby's. David Rubenstein, Carlisle Group philanthropist, uh, heard that this was for sale. He bid for it on the telephone, and he paid $21.5 million for it. Not a bad markup from $1.5 to $21.5 million. So I was asked to give a lecture at the archives on the occasion of uh, the reopening of the Magna Carta exhibit. And each week, the Washington Post has a little box. Uh, on, I think it's on Thursday, and they'll have two or three interesting events the next week. And so the week before my lecture, they had this little box that said something like, Professor A.E. Dick Howard of the University of Virginia will be at the archives on March the 10th at 7.30 uh, to talk about his book, The Road from Runnymede, and his purchase of Magna Carta for $21.5 million. <laughs> so... <laughs> I went home that night and I told my wife, I said, Mary, I said, uh, we are going to start getting some interesting phone calls and invitations to some very fancy events. I said, don't ask any questions. Just, just say, say yes to the invitation. <laughs> so Magna Carta is very much w with us. We don't live in feudal times. We don't have, I realize there's some people on the political scene that I think are every bit as bad as King John, but I won't, <laughs> I won't go that to there today. But at least we're not dealing with the pretensions of monarchy, but we do deal with the same issues ultimately about how you bring about the conditions of ordered liberty that I think have animated Magna Carta from the 13th century to our own time in the 21st. Thank you very much.